So for those of us who find ourselves deep in the traditional church, looking across the landscape, convicted that we must become a different kind of gospel-bearing creation, but not at all sure what that looks like or how we might get there, enter Angie Thurston and Casper Turkile. <laughs> Angie and Casper, both students at Harvard Divinity School, are exploring the mysteries of why and how people gather. And in particular, how the growing number of nuns in the millennial generation find meaning and belonging. Neither Casper nor Angie have a traditional religious background and so identify quite readily with a generation who is more connected with the culture than with the church. It is exactly this identification along with their desire to create meaningful community that compels them to pursue not only the study of faith, but its authentic practice. Am I right? So in talking about what possessed them to, pursue, to uh, pursue a Master of Divinity degree and this work of ministry, Angie says, I wanted to respond to what I saw as a crisis of isolation among young people. And Casper shares his realization that what he's always loved doing which is bringing people together, is in fact a form of ministry. So today, we've simply asked them to share who they are and what they're thinking with us so that we can continue to open our minds to the possibilities. So, Casper and Angie. So my name's Casper to Kyle. Um, as we were introduced to it, we're, Angie and I are both um, graduating in May, so nearly at the end of uh, our seminary experience. God willing. <laughs> <laughs> um, and really what we hope to do today is, is to share some stories of the communities that we've been studying and getting to know. Um, and some of the themes and, and kind of patterns, the DNA perhaps, that, that we think we've seen um, but before we do that, we just wanted to give you a sense of who we are and why we're doing what we're doing, um, which we hope will be helpful. So, uh, as you can hear, I'm from England. Uh, I, I, it makes me sound very intelligent. It's very <laughs> helpful. Uh, my parents are actually both Dutch, but I, I was born and raised in England. Um, and in England, you know, 6% of the population goes to church on Sunday. Um, so it wasn't that I grew up outside the church. It, I, I just had a normal upbringing. Um, no one that I knew went to church. It was just, to be honest, quite irrelevant. Uh, I went to an interesting school. I went to a Waldorf Steiner school. Is anyone familiar with Waldorf education? And now that I look back on it, I think, oh, those Michaelmas lanterns that we made and the walk <laughs> through the village and the songs that we sang to the animals on Christmas Eve and the Midsummer Shakespeare play that happened every year outside. and you know, the advent wreath walk that I walked as a six-year-old where I thought, like, I had discovered something incredible. <laughs> All of those things are actually very religious. But that was not a label that was given to those experiences. They were, they were just part of the magic and mystery of my childhood. Um, I left that school because I wanted to do kind of science-y things. I don't know why. <laughs> I'm not a scientist now. But uh, I, I went into kind of the, the traditional English posh, what we would call public school system, but is actually a private school, very unhelpfully named, um, where, you know, we had a pink blazer and there was sports day and there were four houses. I was in Wellington. Um, all of that kind of thing. And um, there we had chapel every morning. So that's where I did learn the Lord's Prayer, and that's where I did learn that pews are uncomfortable, and uh, you know all the kind of things that come with the accoutrement of, of the old Anglican tradition. And uh, to be honest, that's also where I first encountered the, the kind of religion that I rejected actively. Uh, I came out while I was in high school, and I remember being in a, uh, a study group uh, with my maths teacher, Mrs. Fitzsimmons, who made it very clear that uh, kind of gays were not welcome. And so I, I just assumed, well, if you don't want me, I don't want you. You know, the end. We're done. Um, and, and that was really my relationship with religion until, oh gosh, until I was in, uh, in my undergraduate studies where I had really embraced activism. My work was, was social justice work, um, particularly on climate change. Um, 
So I was mobilizing young people, and I was trying to you know, get people active, and I had all these amazing experiences. And I realized that as I learned more and more about activists who I really respected, um, that they always had some sort of something spiritual going on. <laughs> and that the volunteers who were most reliable, and these were mostly older volunteers that I was working with, often were part of a Quaker group, or maybe went to church, or that there was just something about them that was different. Um, and it's ironic that we're here during the climate negotiations going on in Paris, because uh, in 2008, 2009, I was at the climate talks, um, and at Copenhagen, which was the last kind of like, we're gonna make it together, I kind of had a breakdown, because it failed, and therefore I had failed. And all the work that I had done had been for nothing. And so I, I, you know, I was in a, in a small group of, of activists who were really, you know, we stopped flying, we became vegetarians, like all of these incredible big behavior changes because we were so committed to these values. Um, I just suddenly felt had all been for nothing. And I, I just was in bed for two weeks, to be honest, after that. I, I, and, I, and I wouldn't allow myself to give my heart to my work anymore because it was so painful. And so I just spent three years working in the nonprofit world kind of, you know, doing my thing, but going to the theater in the evening or, you know, <laughs> cooking delicious dinners with my housemates. And after a while, I just looked at my bosses and I was like, I don't want to do, I also dated my boss, big mistake. Uh, I looked at my bosses uh, and I was like, I don't want to do what you're doing. Like, that's not the life I want. But if, you know, my dad was an investment banker, I don't want to do business. I'm not good at following rules. So, you know, government is not going to work. And if it's not nonprofits, then what the hell is it going to be? Turns out it was religion, but I only learned that later. Uh, so I thought, well, what does one do when one doesn't know what to do? Graduate school. Uh, so I, I was like, you know, my, my, my parents studied in America. I, I, through my climate work, I had a lot of engagement with, with American activists, and they seemed to like my enthusiasm more than English people. So I, I just had a sense that America might be a place for me. So I applied to do a public policy degree. And I got into Harvard, and I came to Harvard, and there I sat in my statistics classroom doing, like, what the hell am I doing? Econometrics? This is not what I'm good at. I did a history undergrad, you know. And then I kept meeting people on campus. My friend Erica, who is a Latina Buddhist lesbian, was like, have you heard of the Divinity School? <laughs> and then someone else was like, well, you should meet the uh, Divinity School. And so I just kept meeting these fantastic people who were asking these bigger questions, who were interested in a perspective that was challenging the orthodoxy of neoliberalism and you know, all of the good politics that I was bringing with me. And so I went to the, went to the uh, uh, kind of associate dean for enrollment and I, I shared my story and she said, you're exactly the kind of person who would be welcome here. So I arrived. And it has just been the best decision I have ever made because everything that I had always been doing or wanting to do was affirmed and has been helped to grow during my Divinity School experience. So I suddenly started using the language of ministry to describe the kind of singing parties that I hold at my house <laughs> and uh, the weird things that I make my friends do, like dance around a maypole every May Day. And you know, all, all these things which I thought were just about you know, getting people together and doing tradition things that I had always done in my family, I figured out that actually this is a form of ministry. And because I grew up outside the church, my passion is really for, for people who don't have a connection, either because they've been told they can't or just because they haven't experienced um, a connection to um, both, both the tradition of uh, religion, but also the, to have a language for the experience of, of the unknown. Um, so I just spent a lot of time talking about me, and Angie hasn't said a word, about which I feel dreadful. Angie, let's oh. hear your story. Well, I have been delighted because Casper and I have gotten to tell our stories in each other's company, uh, probably going on a hundred times now, and every time I learned something new, so I totally enjoyed it. Um, and I'm really also thrilled to be here and honored as well. So a bit about me, I grew up in Boulder, Colorado, as I've told some of you, and I was the child of uh, a mother who came from a Jewish household, but it was more politically than spiritually Jewish, and a father who came from a nominally and vaguely Protestant household, but it was more like science is God. So both of them were dissatisfied with the spiritual content of their upbringing, and surprise, surprise, ended up in San Francisco in the late 70s, <laughs> where they met each other. And at that point, my father was agnostic, verging on atheist, and a friend of his named Phil introduced him to this crazy giant blue book that was 2,000 pages long called the Urantia Book. 
and said, you know, I've found a lot of good stuff in here. My dad started reading this thing that no one then had heard of and no one now <laughs> has either. No one now has heard of either. Um, but which is basically a textbook on the universe. And he became increasingly interested, began studying it. My mother, who was now interested in marrying this man, was increasingly upset by the fact that he would go off to study this weird book. So she said, okay, I'm gonna read it so I can talk him out of it. And this was particularly important to her because the last 700 pages of it are the life and teachings of Jesus. And having been raised Jewish, this was definitely not acceptable. And so my mom read the Arantia book to talk my dad out of it, and she describes it as the first truly religious experience she ever had. Because reading the pages, it felt like the questions she had were answered by the, by the coming passages. So all this to say that my parents raised me and my two younger siblings trying to live the teachings of this book, which meant something interesting as far as all of what we're going to talk about later and, and relationship to organized religion. Because here was, here was a family upbringing that by all counts was quite religious insofar as the Arantia book presents religion as the individual's relationship with God and the effort to be useful to other people. And Jesus is the prime example of this work. And so I had a relationship with God, I had a relationship with Jesus, but I'd never read the Bible, and I certainly didn't have a faith community insofar as attending church on a regular basis and participating in all of what that can mean. So I had a sort of hunger, I would say, from a young age to, to socialize this spirituality that was going on in my personal life, in my family life. And we did know other Urantia book readers. Uh, Boulder, Boulder, Colorado, perhaps unsurprisingly, is a hotbed of, <laughs> I, I think statistically, nationwide, there are the most Urantia book readers in Boulder compared to any other, uh, any other area. But anyway, so I did know other Urantia book readers, but it was definitely, I understood from a very young age that this was a marginal thing. <laughs> and what was really nurtured in my home was creativity because neither of my parents had had the spiritual upbringing that they were looking for, and so they basically tried to create it for us. So Casper and I have some funny overlaps in this regard, just in that both of us were really uh, exposed to wonderful and beautiful rituals growing up that we didn't necessarily attach to religion in the way that maybe now we do. So we had family meetings every Sunday where we would sit around and we would say what we were thankful for from that week, we would read a passage, we would talk about it, we would sing, and we would have then at the end fruits of the spirit, which were usually cookies or, or actual <laughs> fruit, <laughs> but <laughs> that was obviously the best part. And a variety of other holiday rituals that my parents basically made up for all that I can tell, uh, but that did revolve around the same holidays that are otherwise in the culture. We just had this kind of personal and creative relationship to them. So I was definitely encouraged and I guess empowered and sort of given by example from a young age to the idea that I could, that I could create in this way, that I could discover what was meaningful experientially to me and then bring it into my own life and the lives of others and that I could look to the lives of others for inspiration to do that. So with this nurturing of creativity from a young age, it's probably not surprising that I ended up exploring the arts and that was where I found my home for a long time. So I grew up doing theater, I grew up doing visual art, writing, and I ended up going to Brown University to study playwriting. And Brown, as some of you may know, has no requirements. So I took 11 playwriting classes and basically dove in head first to this particular art form. And I had a really amazing professor named Paula Vogel uh, who had this philosophy about the arts and really about everything else, which was that circles rise together. And so she was one of the best examples I've ever encountered of someone who lived that in practice and who exhibited this generosity of spirit in everything she did. And it was through her teaching combined with my experience of playwriting that I started to notice that what I valued most deeply about that process was joining with other people in bringing something into existence that didn't exist before. This creative collaboration that came to pass when a play that I just made up in my head or somebody else did then blossomed into something that was so much more than any one person could have imagined by virtue of the combined talents and investment of so many and their, their various diverse strands of 
of, of creative, what, what we might call potential. So I really came to love that process, and I did a lot of it, and I moved to Brooklyn and spent six years living in New York, working in the arts, putting on plays, and trying to make money, so therefore working in development, fundraising, and <laughs> event planning. Uh, so I did that in the arts for, for six years, and in that process, I got to know a bunch of peers, who many of whom were around my age, some of whom I was close with, others that I would just encounter as we worked on creative projects. And to a person, I started to notice that these friends of mine and these peers seemed to be outside of organized religion. They seemed to, in, in their own self-identity and self-understanding, um, they seemed to exclude any particular commitment religiously. And yet, here they were, they were going home for Christmas, they were having Shabbat lucks on Fridays with their friends, they were meditating, whether at a Zendo or just in their room, they all did yoga, we all went to the farmer's market and cared about you know, where our food came from. It was, it, you'd, all of these sort of markers of what could be considered religiosity, but minus the identity. And here I was in the midst of that, still and more and more acutely hungry for spiritual community myself. And I noticed that there was something about what I was experiencing over and over again in the arts, in these creative undertakings and these collaborative projects that felt sort of like Casper was saying about the, the activists. It was like the, there was something I was feeling there, <laughs> right, uh, that I couldn't quite put a finger on, but I started to wonder if it had anything to do with this hunger for spiritual community that I was feeling. And so it was around that era, this was probably five years ago, that I started exclusively for my own benefit, keeping track of places where people seemed to be finding meaningful experiences of belonging the way that I was in the arts, uh, but that might be more sustained in their lives. Because that was the problem. We would work on a project and then it would be over and then you'd sort of lose that community that had formed. So I, at the beginning of this, I labeled this spreadsheet SBNR resources, which stands for spiritual but not religious. I had no idea what to call it, but that seemed like a passable name for then. And in the process of this whole discernment, I discovered that what I was experiencing in Brooklyn seemed to be part of a national trend <laughs> where young people were either unaffiliated or disaffiliating from, from organized religion and yet were, um, as Lisa read, in, in some, that they were increasingly isolated, you know, whether it was, a, whether I understood it to be a crisis of isolation then or not. And so all of those questions combined with my personal desire to really explore more deeply uh, for myself led to, led to Divinity School and led to a class called Introduction to Ministry Studies where we were required to share our spiritual autobiographies much as Casper and I just did. And so I heard his, and basically pounced on him and said, oh my goodness, you see what I see, we need to work together. And so it was from the fall of 2013 that we, that we started this collaboration. Yes, so we heard a lot of this from Andy yesterday, so we will we'll kind of go briefly over it, but there, obviously, the disaffiliation, the kind of distrust, the institutional abandonment of our generation, it's not just religion, it's everything. Right. Um, there's a, you know, there's, there's, there's a whole lot of data which, so you're, you're not alone, that's what I wanna say. Um, there's many other institutions <laughs> asking the same questions. But there's also, um, you know, I, I, and I say this with, with great compassion, but just this, this um, sense of irrelevance, like it's not, what does it speak to me? And I think, you know, I, I, I felt a little silly coming yesterday because I, I, I don't know much about the UMC. I tried to do some reading. Um, but, but, for example, I still didn't realize that, um, like, homosexuality is against the teaching of the church. I was just like, oh, my God, are we still dealing with that? You know? And, uh, and no offense, but, like, if, we, if we're still having that conversation, then we, I mean, this is kind of irrelevant. Um, but, so, so there's just a lot, uh, you know, there's a lot of barriers that you guys have up in front of you, which makes it really hard um, for people like me to kind of want to join. Um, so, so I, th there's, just, there's just a lot to deal with. But um, I think a lot of this comes from the, you know, the 80s and 90s and the moral majority. And, and Christianity has been defined by the nastiest 
end of it. And, and so for a lot of people like me, that's what we thought, you know, when I, when I came to America, I was like, America plus religion equals danger. Um, so that, there's just a lot of that kind of brand issues uh, that, that one has to deal with. Um, and the real kind of, I think, interesting thing for us, and, you know, we all know this stuff, um, but is the, the enormous generational gaps here. And what I think is most interesting is that you can see even within the millennials, like segment, younger millennials are even more disaffiliated. So, I mean, this is just, it's a one-way trend. Um, but again, we all know this. I just want to ground us in this before we get to the good news. Okay, so <laughs> hang on. Okay. Um, yes. Well, and the good news, I think, begins with this, conversation about community. And so just to add to the situation related to the disaffiliation trends is what we've learned, or one of the things we've learned, is that when it comes to the people who are saying that they're spiritual but not religious, that in reality, often, that means they are neither in terms of the practices that they carry out in their lives and the language that they use to, to understand and to, to make meaning of their lives. And so there's some very direct and quite significant correlation between spirituality and community, which we certainly don't need to tell you, but which sociologists have discovered. <laughs> and, and that is definitely informing the way, that, the way that we're thinking about this work and also I think what's going on across religious traditions where they're really looking in a, in a whole variety of different contexts at the ways that people are taking practices into personal contexts. And that can be decried as far as the cafeteria of religion where you just pick and choose and what I was kind of describing among my friends. Um, but it can also lead to some exciting and new possibilities as far as those who feel that kind of autonomy. They feel the autonomy of, okay, I'm, I'm not going to be constrained. Have, having, in many cases, not been raised in a particular religious tradition, I will not feel constrained by that. And yet I am interested in what is going to inform the decisions I make, the, my understanding of what success is in my life, <laughs> how I relate to the people around me, all these basic things. People who are outside of organized religion are trying to figure those things out and often, it seems, are interested in figuring them out in community, but not community that has creed as the threshold. So that's just something that we've discovered, particularly in relationship to this, this population of the so-called spiritual but not religious. And just as a resource, has, are you familiar with Nancy Ammerman's work at Boston University? Okay, great. That's just, you know, that book is just so helpful to, to really delve into this, this question. And for me, what's lovely about it is that there is so much effort by, by you know, the SBNRs or, or the nuns or whatever. Like, they're really trying, you know? And they're, they're looking for things and they're downloading a meditation app and, and they want to go to this kind of Teze service or they're going to try and go. And they're, they're really, you know, so it's, uh, I, I always say don't blame them <laughs> because they're really trying. But it's hard to do on your own. I remember when I lived in London, I, w I downloaded a meditation app. <laughs> and I was like, well, what do I do now? <laughs> okay, we'll press play. Mm, what am I having for dinner? <laughs> you know? And it, it's really hard. The only time I really took that on as a practice was when a friend of mine who was doing a PhD in behavior change said, I need eight participants to track over six weeks uh, meditating and behavior change. So because I was doing it for a friend and she really needed the data that I was kind of writing down every morning after my, my 20 minute sit, that was the only way it really became a practice. So this, it's hard to do on your own, but we knew that already. Um, so after all this kind of like, oh boy, it's hard, it's difficult. There's another story, <laughs> hooray! Because what we found, and this, is, this was just so much fun. Uh, you know, Angie and I had this spreadsheet, she shared it on Google Docs. Uh, there was a list of random organizations. I was like, oh, I know a couple more, like let's add to it. And once you start looking for it, it is everywhere, <laughs> everywhere. And so we started populating that spreadsheet and it, it sort of became like a hopeful landscape uh, where suddenly instead of looking at the, oh, disaffiliation trends, we were looking at the affiliation trends to all of these unlikely organizations. Mm -hmm. And so these are all organizations where people are looking to help them think through their purpose. They're looking for meaning, they're looking for community and belonging and finding it in some unlikely places. So CrossFit. Do we have any CrossFitters in the room? 
Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. That is really exciting. Um, so you should find these two uh, hunk hunky individuals later if you have any further questions. But um, the most frequently cited example when we started talking about this was CrossFit. Um, and to toot our own horn, you might have seen the New York Times on Saturday, <laughs> where um, es essentially the, you know, the, the institution itself, this is not something we're labeling onto CrossFit. CrossFit is saying, yeah, we're a religion run by biker gangs. <laughs> uh, you know, they, they get what they're doing. They are choosing not to make more money because it will risk the community values that they have at the center. They are making all sorts of totally crazy decisions when you're looking <laughs> at it as a business, but they make a lot of sense if you're looking at, at it as a church. So CrossFit gets what we're talking about now. Uh, actually, Angie and I are both in the process of trying to join a box. The gyms are called boxes. We literally can't join because they are full. There are 23 affiliates in Boston. The two that we've tried so far literally said, I'm sorry, we're full. When did that last happen to a church? I mean, it's insane. Um, there's all sorts of things to say about whether the, you know, church and CrossFit should be more open. I, I totally get that. But it's just astounding how popular this thing is now. There are more than 4 million CrossFitters around the world, around 15,000 uh, 15, boxes. And what's fabulous about CrossFit is that it's not just like a gym where you go and do your thing. There is something called the workout of the day, where literally everyone around the world today is doing the same workout. Is, this shit is liturgical. Excuse my French. But, uh, right? Um, oh, sorry, wrong audience. Um, but, but this is so real. That's what I want to communicate. So people arrive. It's not just a bunch of strangers, because you go every week, four days a week, at, for the 6 a.m. class. You know the 13 other people who are there. My friend Ali, who really introduced me to all of this, said, I have to let them know when I'm going on vacation, because they call me if I'm not there. They're like, yo, where you at? You know, like, we expect you to be here. There is accountability. There is commitment. This is serious for these people. So, I mean, I even just love this photo because they're kind of, you know, is it prayer? Are they in pews? Who knows? But there, there is a real, um, yeah, there's a, there's a real commitment to it. Um, this, there's so many things about it which I, which I love. But um, I went to uh, the, the business school where this friend Ali is a student, and she, had, she loves CrossFit so much. She had organized for Greg Glassman, who's the, the CEO of CrossFit and one of the founders, to come and do a case, you know, business school case on CrossFit. And it was all about he and his wife separated. They founded it together. So she sold her 50% stake of the business um, to people who were within the CrossFit world who they liked. But these two guys wanted to turn each box into a point of sale so that they would be, there would be T-shirts and protein shakes and bars and all sorts of other things that would really bring in the money. And Greg and his side of the team were like, no way. So they took on kind of credit card levels of um, you know, interest rates of debt to, to buy out the other stake. And... Um, many stories about the hilarious, because they're like super macho and bro-y, right? So like, they, they were sending texts to the other side being like, I'm gonna crush you, you know? Like, this, not everything here is good, is what I wanna say, but, um, but they, they really fought hard and they bought the entire thing. And so uh, Greg is now the CEO, and he is sort of like a high priest of the movement. Uh, we organized an event at the Divinity School where we asked him to come and talk about CrossFit as church. And usually the Divinity School is full of people like me, and America has not been good for my physique. Um, but this time, the whole kind of Sperry Room, which is the, the big auditorium for us, was just filled with like, whoa, hench people. And we're like, who are these? Never and held this much muscle mass in 200 just, years. The arms were like my so thighs. Um, but they were, there to, they, they were there to see the oracle. You know, it was, it was really something. Mm -hmm. and, and they came from California. From, I mean, it was not just Boston. It, it was a big deal. And so th there is this kind of, there's all these different pieces which make it feel like church. But the evangelism is nearly the most obvious one. You know, you know if your friends go to CrossFit because they're going to invite you to come along. It, you know, the only way to start a new CrossFit box is to write an essay, how it has changed your life, and go to a two-day seminar. That's all you need. You can open it wherever you want to. You can open it right next to an existing CrossFit box. Um, so that the kind of the polity of CrossFit is a really interesting uh, thing. Every year, they get together at the CrossFit Games where the faithful gather and compete against one another and cheer each other on. Um, and so there's this, this feeling of being, something, being part of something bigger, but also in your own little family and your own little tribe. 
they name different work counts after soldiers or police, um, police people who have died uh, in, in service. So there is a way of honoring the dead um, that happens in the workout. The workout is the liturgy. Greg Glassman says, we are not building a skyscraper, we are shepherding a flock, or we are tending an orchard. So like, again, these people really get it. Like they really understand what people are bringing to, to these boxes and what they get from it. And you know, there are so many stories of people bringing their kids along. So it's a kind of intergenerational space. Older people who you know, might have become a widow and then join a box and find a new lease of life with a whole new group of people. Um, if you need a ride to the hospital, someone from your box will bring you. That these, again, I just really want to stress that it's easy to kind of dismiss this thing. It's like, oh, that's cute. You know, that, that, that's nice. But this is real. All right? That's really what I, what I want to communicate, that people are really looking after and loving one another um, and, and really being in community together. And just to add one other thing, since um, th uh, for those who have not participated in CrossFit, as we have not either, maybe we can ask the two in the room later, but just to, to clarify that the experience of going to CrossFit is, is categorically different from the experience of going to a gym. Your relationships with the other people are the first thing that happens. Part of why Casper and I can't get into a box is because we have to be basically inducted in by somebody else. And once, once you do, you are inextricably linked to those other people because you set personal goals and they hold you accountable to them. And then you hold them accountable to yours. So you, you cannot succeed without them and they cannot succeed without you. And so the kinds of relationships that form as a result of that personal transformation that occurs are much deeper than, in many cases, uh, relationships that people have in other parts of their lives. There is a whiteboard where everyone's goals is written on the whiteboard. It's for everyone to see. And you are cheered along. You know, we're all going to do 21 whatevers. And if you're the last one finishing, everyone is standing there kind of clapping, cheering you on. Like, they, they're really giving it all. Yeah. So when we, when we were talking to this Times reporter, he was saying, well, it's for profit if it closes. <laughs> doesn't it just go away? And certainly, I think a lot would change if the for-profit CrossFit closed. But in terms of the relationships, rather than people just going and joining another gym, it seems more like the phenomenon that goes on here is something like Alcoholics Anonymous or another program where you're mutually accountable. And so the relationships that, for that form go far beyond the, the nominal goal of the program itself. So just to sort of add that, that depth to, to what happens at CrossFit. You're ready for another case study? Yes, all right. Okay, so we promise that after this it will not be fitness case studies. And this is one that I will just put out there right up front that we are both, I would say, significantly more critical of uh, and, and also, interestingly, more experienced with. So this is SoulCycle. Who, who's been to SoulCycle? Want Hillary, yes, okay. Y'all should go. You should go. It's, it, I mean, if you have $34 to spare uh, for a single class. So this is SoulCycle. SoulCycle's motto is find your soul. Uh, it looks like a spin class. It is, that is, that is the least of what it is, I would say. So Soul, I'm just going to narrate a little of the experience of going to SoulCycle, which Casper and I did. So we went with our friend Zoe, and Zoe, uh, Zoe is Jewish, and she is in divinity school, and she is deeply committed to her faith. But the thing that she talks about, I would say, probably more than Judaism, is cross is um, Soul Cycle, and we were kind, or I anyway, was rather nonplussed by how enthusiastic she was, and finally said, "Okay, we'll, we'll go, we'll go." So we go to Soul Cycle in Chestnut Hill. They tend to open in pretty, pretty posh neighborhoods, and you know, big find your soul right outside, and all of this language which you can see, find freedom in our sprints, we have uh, raise the roof, our own. there's all of these words that are all about aspiration, about intention, about the, these, these Being our best selves. values that they sort of plaster on the walls. And so you go and you, as you enter the space, there's a single bike that's on a pedestal, it's elevated in the center of the room, and it's lit from below. And the room is dark. These, these happen by candlelight. And so you go into a darkened room with candles and glow sticks and stuff like that. And there's this sort of elevated platform in the middle. And all of the other bikes are laid out. They're stationary bikes numbered. And 
there's a 45 minute window and it's the same amount of time every time, it's predictable. You know that there will be not only 45 minutes that you'll be on that bike, but what the arc is going to be. So in our, in our liturgical analysis, we have definitely been made aware of this. So it always culminates in what they call the hill ballad, which is where you, they turn out all the lights. So it's already dark in there, but then they turn it all out so you can't even totally see dark. each other's faces. Totally and you just, you're there on your bike. And throughout this whole thing, they're saying, you know, we ride as a pack, everyone is an individual, but you, like, when you're inhaling intention and exhaling expectation, you are doing that in relationship with the other people on this team with you, right? So then you turn out the light and everybody is there in this fervent, you're all sweaty from all of the biking you've been doing. And they put on some ballad. It's, I don't know what ours was, but it's always something that's already sort of a tearjerker, right? And then you're, you're asked to amp up the, uh, the incline on your bike and the so you're resistance. Really pushing hard. So you're really pushing hard. You're going up a steep hill in the dark to a ballad. And Zoe said, Oh, I think I cry every three times. You know, everybody, there's this, there's now a studied phenomenon of people crying during the hill ballad at Soul Cycle. Uh, but basically, this is, this is this release that you get to do in the dark in the midst of this uh, daily or weekly ritual experience that you have of going to this gym. So SoulCycle, as I mentioned, costs $34 for a single class. And you can also, and maybe this is the next one, um, we, we have under here paying for pews, you can also pay <laughs> significantly more in order to be able to sign up. $10,000. Yeah, $10,000 to, to sign up in advance of everybody else because these are so popular that when the class goes online on a Monday, they all sell out right away. And so you can pay $10,000 so that you get to sign up on Sunday before everybody else. And then you can also pay more to be in the front. There's this can be in the front There's row. a hierarchy. Yeah, and basically it's, it's something you earn because if you're in the front, then you're leading the pack. Everyone's following you in their motions. Because this is, it's choreographed. It's not, you're not just spinning. There's, there's upper body and all of this. And the people who lead it, it who, are, who are positioned on that platform, are uh, hired in large part because of their performance performance abilities. They're trained as dancers or theater people. They're not fitness experts. They are there to give you the, ve the feeling. Like, that's their job. And so under the, under the preaching category, I mean, they're leading in a number of ways. And it's certainly not just the physical. And Zoe told us a story even of one of her, of her Soul Cycle instructors pausing. I think it may have been the Hill Ballad and basically saying, you know, this is not the kind of music we would usually play. But it was a James Taylor song. It was a James Taylor song. And she had just lost a loved one and said, and, and said I'm going to play this song in honor of him and proceeded to eulogize this person over the course of whatever it was, four minute song. So in all of this, the, they're using the language and they're unabashedly using it. And we have had a couple of conversations with people who are representatives of SoulCycle and inquired as to the Finding Your Soul language that they use. We have yet to get a satisfying answer about what they mean by that. But the, the intention that seems to be set by this place and the way they're going about what they do certainly doesn't seem to be unaware of the religious implications. And so we're going to show you something to just underscore that. Yeah, as Angie gets the video going, it's. Um it's remarkable how savvy these organizations are about this stuff. Like, they, they really know what they're doing. But often, they don't really have the, the goods to back up the promise. And that's really our critique of Soul Cycles. It literally says, find your soul. But like, what are you going to find um, at, at Soul Cycle? And this is just, you know, I, I invite you to, to watch this through our eyes, if I can ask that. Look, look for the religious imagery in this little promo video, which was to launch the Soul Cycle app through which you can book a class and everything else. Oh, happy day. Oh, happy day. Oh, happy day. Oh, happy day. Oh, yes, it launch. Oh, yes, it launch. That's right, it launch. That's right, it launch.
Oh my God, right? <laughs> I mean, it's not like we have to look hard for this kind of stuff. <laughs> So, <laughs> um, yeah, there it is. So there, are, well, I mean, it, it's probably worth mentioning a, a little bit more. You know, we ended the How We Gather report, which we have, I think, about 50 copies of just outside, if you're interested in picking up one, um, or you can just download it online, um, with, with three questions, which were, you know, who are we serving? Because the, overwhelmingly, this is rich white women. Um, you know, to, to be frank, like, this, well, and, and again, like it's easy to say, Meh. but like these are women who have to pretend 24 hours a day, right? They are maintaining this image. They are working so hard. And finally, it's dark and they can just let it go. You know, what a release. Thank God. You know, this place is offering something of so much value to them. Sure, it's giving them a workout. There's all sorts of studies on how actually the workout is not very good at SoulCycle, but that's not why people are going. They're, like, it's not actually that taxing. Um, it's just very hot and you sweat a lot, so you feel like you're working hard. But they're going because they're getting an emotional release. They're getting a connection from, you know, this person who's sitting there cycling saying, who are you riding for today? You know, are you riding for your kids? You're writing for, like, that, that's what they're asking as you're sitting there sweating. So, like, you are doing all this reflective, intense work. Um, so there's a reason why these people are coming, but overwhelmingly, it's rich white women. The second question was, how are they leading? So, you know, this is all about uh, performance, you know, fr from the front. This is not, um, it, it doesn't challenge the consumer mentality, right? It, it, it's not affirming um, that you have, oh, I mean, it is, but it... It's, it's so fake. <laughs> that, that's, that's really what I want to say. Like that it, it's so problematic in terms of like what, what are actually the values that, it, that, are, that, that it's stimulating. And, and, and the yet this, the starvation is so acute that people that are... They'll take it. The, yeah, this is where they can find it. So they'll find it right. if they can. And there are other people there <laughs> doing it with them, even if you don't really get to know them, which I think can vary. In some cases, people really do find a community at SoulCycle. But... But it's a very individual thing. You feel thing. like you're in a community because there are a whole bunch of people packed in around right. you who are also experiencing what you're experiencing. Right. And then the third question was, what about God? Um, you know, in, in its broadest word. Um, but yeah, the kind of challenging, perhaps the spiritual shallowness of the whole thing. So that, those, those are the three questions that maybe you can keep in your head as you think about the other examples we'll talk about. Mm -hmm. But there are wonderful examples too. Um, the Dinner Party is, is an organization set up by Lennon Flowers, who's a dear friend of ours now. Um, which I think really exhibits a lot of the best of what these organizations have to offer. At its simplest, it's a potluck to, talk and, uh, to come and talk about your experience of grief or loss. Um, so a lot of people in their 20s and 30s who are really the, the main constituency for the dinner party, um, again, this kind of having, having to, to perform or to pretend through your Facebook profile or whatever else, um, where can you come and be real? And often the friends that you can be real with don't really know how to engage about the death of your mother or, you know, wh where do I go? So you go to the dinner party. Uh, you log on and you say where you are and they connect you to a table host or they invite you to be a host for the table. And you literally gather with strangers or friends or a mix of the two. Everyone brings a dish and you sit and you talk. Um, and so, you know, there's this obvious element of kind of spiritual accompaniment. And there's a great sense of healing. Um, the, the kind of tradition of the small group was alive and well. And more than anything, hello, Eucharist, sitting around a table having a meal, <laughs> you know. Um, and, and again, Lenin is very conscious of, of this connection to religion and is asking a lot of questions about, well, you know, people are coming because they've lost a dog, you know, their beloved pet. Is that allowed? Or, you know, someone's in their, someone's 45 and they want to come, but we're for 20s and 30s. How, how do we do it? And so they're, they're kind of really trying to figure out how to, how to answer these questions of, you know, who are we for and how wide is the, the welcome and everything else. Um, you know, definitely also questions about how do we make this work financially? They've just launched their annual uh, Indiegogo kind of crowdfunder campaign, which is really how they sustain themselves. Um, but this is a completely, like, this does not make financial sense. It's, it's never going to be a business. Um, people feel like, well, I've brought my casserole or I've brought my salad. Why would I also pay something? You know, we're so unused to paying for community, like actually giving money to that. We just expect it to be there. So they're asking real questions about how, how can we make this work financially. And this might be a good moment to just zoom out really fast to say, 
after Casper and I had populated this spreadsheet sufficiently, then we said, okay, we need to start getting to know the people who are leading these organizations. And so we had a good 25 conversations with leaders from across the country who were involved in communities like this one. And in the course of those conversations, we started to notice a number of, of common um, struggles that the leaders were facing. And so some of the things that Casper just mentioned of how do we scale this and how do we make this something that is sustainable beyond the organic need that we were responding to, right? Lenin had, had lost her mom and she had a couple of friends who had also lost people close to them and they were finding that this was not something that they had a forum in which to discuss, so they created the dinner party. Now there are tables springing up all over the world, and so she didn't necessarily mean to be an entrepreneur or somebody running an organization, but that has basically transpired. So there's a lot of that sort of moment occurring in the evolution of these organizations. So we'll, we'll show you a few more of them. Yeah, and, and bef just before we go yeah. there, you know, Lenin had worked at Ashoka, which is kind of a social entrepreneurship uh, organization. And nearly all of the organizations that we'll show you go to that world for help. You right. know, they have the kind of the incubators and the startup advice and the, you know, scaling questions, all of that kind of stuff. I kind of wish that they would go to the church and be like, hey, how do we work with commitment? How do we do leadership development? How do we, you know, I'm suddenly leading this group of people who are all coming to talk about grief. Uh, can I like lead a blessing for the meal maybe? I, I don't know. Like I wish they would come to you for help, um, but they don't know that you're there to offer it. Um, so that's an invitation to you to kind of think about how, how could you be of service to these organizations as they do the work they're doing. There are, I mean, literally a hundred of these. We, the spreadsheet is growing all the time, but we'll just race through a couple more examples. Uh, Citizen Well is mobilizing the well-being industry, so yoga, meditation, all of the other organizations, to take action for social justice. So they've really been mobilizing people around the fight for 15, which is the minimum wage fight, um, which they were helping with, particularly in New York. The Millennium Train, the Millennial Trains Project brings millennials together on a cross country uh, train ride to. Pilgrimage. Uh, <laughs> say it again. Yeah, pilgrimage, total pilgrimage. Um, to, uh, to explore kind of renewal of urban areas and new ideas. Um, and we, we, we called Patrick and we're like, hey, Patrick, um, we're from the Divinity School. And he was like, whoa, <laughs> what are you saying about my thing? It is not religious, uh, definitely not. And after kind of 10 minutes, he was like, well, Maybe people are kind of spiritual, and then after 20 minutes, he was like, well, we, someone did bless the train before it left the <laughs> station. And we're like, dude, come on. Uh, so you know, it differs as to how people react to this, but it, it totally makes sense. Um, and they talked about maker spaces. The Artisans Asylum is, uh, is a maker space in Boston, uh, or in Somerville, I should say. Um, and you know, it's, it's a place where kind of geeky, weirdy, wonderful people get together to make things, um, soldering, chopping, building. Um, but you know, that's really just the surface activity. That space is open 24 hours. Yeah. They get people coming in at 2 a.m. to solder instead of self-harm. It is a welcoming place where they can always go. It's a refuge, right? So these, these places offer so much more than just the obvious things. Uh, we have Tea with Strangers on the top left, which is something that the creator of it acknowledges would not have been necessary even 10 years ago and is kind of crazy that it's necessary now. But it's basically a tool that exists to connect people in largely cities who are strangers to have tea for three hours. And he can't, he can't keep up with it at all. I mean, it was just... It was in Forbes, and it was the number one article in Forbes for like two weeks, because everybody's like, oh, I want that. <laughs> um, so they have hosts all over the country who are, who are hosting tea with strangers. Um, we have Daybreaker on here, which is a morning dance party. And there are two of these entities sort of in competition with each other, Daybreaker and Morning Gloryville. And these are both substance-free, before-work dance parties where people you know, sometimes hundreds of people get together and they simply share the experience of dancing, but there is a lot, we, we went to one of these as well, <laughs> there's a lot of language that's included in that as well that is an attempt to connect people to each other. We are one. Things like, like that, as, yes. as the music is playing and everyone's <laughs> dancing, it's like, we're all connected, you know. So like there's a kind of sermon from the front. Thread in the middle is in Baltimore, and it is an organization that exists for um, especially at-risk high school students, and maybe even middle school students, basically 
carrying them through the course of their studies, they will, as, as Aaron, who I spoke with about this, told me, they'll have eight people who just wrap someone up in love for a decade of their life. And this is basically, they consider it to be an activist movement <laughs> because this is how they consider it to be most effective to change society. But all of what they actually do is predicated on human relationships and relationships of loving service. The Harry Potter Alliance is a particular favorite of mine because I lead a class called Harry Potter as a Sacred Text, um, and where we do like Lectio Divina with, with, with Harry Potter. Um, but this is a, you know, the fandom, if you're not familiar with the fandom, it's powerful. And the Harry Potter Alliance uses the narrative and characters um, and, and the kind of calendar of the Harry Potter world to mobilize fans to take social justice action. So it'll often be entry level issues like fair trade or marriage equality, things um, which is kind of easier to get people mobilized in. But these are people who would never be taking, they're, ne they're never gonna be activists, but because they're committed to the story and this, and this world of Harry Potter, they feel emboldened to, to to take action together. So uh, very kind of traditional, I would say, and you have chapters in high schools and colleges, so kind of congregation-based organizing in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, camp Grounded is a summer camp for adults, which is tech-free, so you're not allowed to um, bring, your, bring your laptop or your phone. You're not allowed to have W Talk, which is work talk, um, and you basically get to live in an imaginary space for a couple of weeks um, and do all the things that people love to do, like sing together around a campfire, but are kind of scared to do on their own, but they'll do it at Camp Grounded because someone lets them do it. Um, the November Project is another fitness example, which is always free, that meets three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, um, Friday at 6.30 a.m. Um, the one in Boston does the Harvard uh, um, Stadium steps up and down. It, I nearly threw up, it was really unpleasant. But um, again, like a big kind of like, you know, uh, pumping people up and getting people yeah. ready. If you don't show up, your photo is pa posted on the website with the, the, the bar, where were you today? Um, so again, this theme of accountability is very strong. Mm -hmm. um, Open Masters is a self-directed, community-supported learning um, environment where you kind of get to create your own learning experience. So if you want to learn about chair design or you want to open an organic farm, or as more and more people want to do, learn about spirituality, they're mm -hmm. launching an alt MDiv. So people can basically f read Meister Eckhart and have someone explain what they can learn from these, these ancient texts and, and all sorts of uh, other MDiv-esque things. And then finally, on the very right, the US Department of Arts and Culture. Who knew we had a US Department of Arts and Culture? It's not actually a branch of the US Department. <laughs> but it's a, a fabulous, fabulous organization. Um, multi-class, multi-racial um, arts organization that mobilizes people to kind of vision what their community could look like in the future and to take action on that. So they host a People's State of the Union where you get together with a small group and share your experience of the State of the Union. Um, and then they turn, they, they, they kind of collect all the, the visions and then turn it into a big poem. So in early February, look out for the, for the State of the Union poem that came out of these, these local circles. So this is just to offer you a, a sense of the breadth and scale of this kind of work, um, because it is, it is really everywhere. And we've been sharing about what's happening in the United States, but this is also happening in other countries as well. So it's, it's a pretty large, a large scale um, process. So in all of this, as we were seeing that the function that was being described of these organizations was actually only the, only the beginning, we started to ask, okay, well, what is, what is the thematic DNA that is actually connecting all of these disparate undertakings? And for those of you who have looked at how we gather, these will be familiar, these six themes, but this is what we found, was that these were communities that were cultivating social transformation, personal transformation, accountability, creativity, purpose finding, and community. And they were doing it in different ways and to different degrees. So for instance, CrossFit, we saw a lot of accountability, we saw a lot of personal transformation and a lot of community. So that was kind of what we lifted up from our findings there. And yeah. what was really fun, when Greg Glassman, this CrossFit CEO, came to the Divinity School, he was like, well, yeah, those are our core values, and now I want to earn the other three badges. Um, <laughs> I'm a competitive <laughs> guy. Like, we're going to get social whoa, transformation, yeah. we're going to fight big sugar, <laughs> we're going to get creativity and purpose finding, just you wait. Yeah, he was <laughs> so all That was it. the power of framing. But just on CrossFit, which I want to mention, they are now mobilizing their boxes to take on the sugar industry. So they care deeply about um, the, the dangerous effects of sugar, particularly on children. Um, and so they, uh, after the event at, at the Divinity School, they flew back to 
California, where they were over nine days touring nine different Senate districts to host events with the local CrossFit boxes to lobby the senators to take action. And they were all uh, swing votes in the health committee on a bill on labeling soda as toxic for children. So, you know, community organizers are, are often working with congregations, and we're kind of saying, hey, guys, look, here are other communities of commitment and values who are ready to be mobilized. Um, so CrossFit is already doing that. Yes. Uh, and so just some other examples. The U.S. Department of Arts and Culture, Creativity, Community, Social Transformation, and the Millennial uh, Train Project, which is about purpose, um, uh, personal transformation, and accountability. So, I mean, th these, I mean, we just made this up. Like, this is not deep sociology, but this is just stuff that we kept seeing. Um, but we then, uh, the, the Fetzer Institute gave us a call and said, well, we really like you to, to do something similar as how we gather, but looking at innovation within religious communities. And so now the next slide is kind of embarrassing for us to say to you because turns out there's a seventh theme and it's kind of like God. Um, <laughs> so we, we call it something more, but um, uh, essentially what, what we kept seeing is we were looking at these uh, kind of more religious innovators. So these are things like pop-up Shabbat in New York, um, which brings people together um, Jews and non-Jews to essentially have a meal and kind of reflect on a theme of conversation. Um, or uh, Yeah, we're, and this, this whole report, which encompasses this across religious traditions, is something that we're going we're gonna to have done and printed and designed in January. Um, but where we basically found, oh, it looks like these things, whether it's pop-up Shabbat or it's Buddhist geeks, which is uniting the Buddhist meditation community, you know, yeah. um, or whether it's St. Lydia's or these other dinner churches that are uh, and you, we have Simple Church, which is Zach Kersey's church that many of you know, that, that are resembling in some ways more the communities that we were finding in the secular landscape than they are the their own church. traditions, mainstream presence. And so that, that was basically our task with the Fetzer Institute and which we then have kind of put together and are, and are almost done with. But yes, so we were seeing, interestingly, that a lot of these groups within, within the religious landscape while they may not have had as many of the other six themes represented, uh, the one that all of these secular communities, by and large, are missing, at least in terms of their language and their self-understanding, was the one that was so strong, of course, in the religious landscape. But what was most interesting to us is that although the, the organizations in these secular organizations are missing the language of spirituality, when we brought them together, they are so spiritual. It was so interesting. So we, we invited them all to come together. This is at the Divinity School uh, earlier this month. Um, and we, you know, <laughs> I remember one favorite moment when we realized this. At the end of the two and a half days, we kind of did a closing circle where we asked, what are you hopeful for? What are you fearful of? Um, and what are you proud of? And they were like, hope isn't strong enough. It isn't strong enough. I have faith in. And we're like, whoa. <laughs> person after person is rejecting the language of hope and replacing it with faith. <laughs> It's their idea. But so all of these you know, people we talked to, we'd, we'd kind of interviewed and we'd become friends with, and, and there were so many themes of being isolated in leadership, of feeling like they were struggling to communicate you know, what they were doing, of like any community having to deal with sexual assault, racism, everything else that is you know, in our culture which shows up when we get together. Um, they were struggling to figure out how to deal with those things. So we said, come together, let's just learn from one another. Let's share um, all what we're doing. And we wanted to make that kind of link explicit to religion. So we hosted it at the Divinity School. And we invited some of our favorite ministers just to come and share their story. Um, so we had a wonderful local Presbyterian pastor who um, is the president of GBIO, which is the Greater Boston Interfaith Organizing Network, and, and my preaching professor at the moment. Um, and Melissa Bartholomew, who um, after a kind of legal career, came to the Divinity School and leads a lot of racial justice and healing work. Um, a invited Baptist, Baptist lay minister, lay minister um, and we invited the, them to come and share their story, and it kind of infused the, the time together with this reflection or mirror of, of traditional religion to see their own work in a different way. And you know, the guy who runs Artisans Asylum, that makerspace I mentioned, said, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a priest, and now I realize I kind of am one. You know, so it's, th th they, we, what we hoped, apart from the relationships with one another, is that they might see religion as a resource that they could draw from in different ways. And if you imagine, I mean, just taking this relatively small group of people, these people are all doing community leadership that I think in our Harvard Divinity School language, we would call ministry, whether or not they do. 
and they are without any infrastructural support, right? We brought, we brought them together to say, we noticed that you're all doing some of the same things, but they had never met each other before. This is the first time that they had been in the same room and could actually hear, oh, we are facing the same challenges. We are all, you know, and so there's no, there's no denominational support for them in any way. There's no even infrastructure that's kind of generating whatever could be could be brought out in, in potential from what they're each individually doing. Uh, so just to, to know that they are other than some of the work that, that we're starting to do and we're starting to see them do with each other, they're doing this work of building community in isolation. So that's, that's part of what we're trying to, to help to shift. So what we wanted to kind of communicate to you is not necessarily that you have to start gyms or you know do all the things that these organizations are doing, but that you have so many gifts to give to these leaders, to the people who are participating in these organizations. Um, simply the, the, the language to describe an experience of the divine or, or the unknown. Um, the practices, centuries old practices which help people center themselves, come into relationship, all of the, you know, the, these are the things which I have just been so excited by in divinity school. Um, you know, now, now I'm trying to learn how to pray, which is a whole new interesting exploration for me. But there's, there's, there's so many resources which if you can talk about it in a way that doesn't frighten people and is invitational and starts with a question of, you know, what, what do you want to learn about? There is so much that you have to give. The process of training and formation, you know, we're, we're trying to think through like, you know, half, half of the group who came to that gathering were like, well, I should go to divinity school. Well, yeah. You know, and, and HDS is already kind of full of this kind of, you know, there's, there's no Presbyterians left. I think there's one Methodist student, but instead there's more and more students like us who we don't really fit. You know, I was, you know, a friend of mine was like, well, my dad was Catholic and my mom was Presbyterian, so I'm both. And I'm true to both, you know, like, don't tell me I'm not one because I'm the other, I'm both. Um, or, you know, all, just everything yeah. you can imagine is at HDS. Um, <laughs> and so the curriculum is having to change in response to the, the needs of the students. But, you know, as, as Annie was saying yesterday, we, we don't need an MDiv to know how to build relationships. But I think there is something about being connected to a tradition that makes me feel safer and me feel connected to, you know, it's not just about me. That's why I'm seeking ordination as a Unitarian Universalist minister, um, because I was like, I, I can't do this on my own, and I want a community of support and accountability. Um, and I, uh, that's just some, something I think that the church, capital C, c can offer. Uh, I mean, then there's the buildings, like, you know, <laughs> they're empty so much of the time. Can't we use them in an interesting way? Uh, the, the, the liturgical calendar, you know, that I, I love hosting, uh, things at my house which kind of mark time in a way. So every Easter, I host an egg painting uh, party where we do the Ukrainian, you know, dyes with wax. And it's, it's people like, whoa, this is so much fun. Can we do this every Sunday? And I'm like, no, only at Easter. <laughs> um, so, yeah, you know, there's, there's really fun ways that we can come back into a different kind of calendar um, through, through the traditions that we have. Um, polity, and, oh, sorry. Oh, no, go ahead. Well, just to reiterate, so many of these efforts are fledgling, and yeah. some of the organizations that we've shown here will be gone in five years. We, you know, there's there's a lot of people just trying stuff, and some of it will work and some of it won't. But I think so much of the wisdom that's carried in this room and in this tradition is is about longevity, <laughs> about that. I think, John, you were describing the success and failure of experiencing failure and not quitting and not quitting and not quitting. And these individuals as individuals don't necessarily have that perspective, especially because so many of them are young. And yet, if they can be in, in conversation with people who do and can learn from the experience that comes from all of that uh, trying and failing and trying again, I think it, it has, there, there's a lot of potential in that, basically, for, for their work and, and I think for years. And uh, polity seems like a weird thing to offer, but you know, as these organizations grow and they're dealing with different chapters and like, how do we make decisions and all of that kind of stuff, you've been doing that for hundreds of years. Like, you know, you know how to work that kind of stuff. But you can do all of this, you can offer all of this help, but you cannot try and make them Methodists. Mm -hmm. You just can't. Because as soon as they hear that, as soon as I hear that, I'm like, not interest. I don't trust you. Um, so I need you to be generous. You know, I don't even want you to, to, to make them Christian. I just want you to help them to love and to live together well. That's all I ask. 
And that's something you can give. But it, they're not going to use your language. They're not going to use your logos. That's not what this is about. So the next chapter. We have this next report, which is just an excuse to gather the next group of people, <laughs> which is really fun. Our hope is that we can bring these secular innovators with these religious innovators together because they can learn so much from one another. Um, as Angie was saying, you know, the religious innovators are great at helping kind of experience the something more, but the secular innovators are great at being like, no, accountability actually really matters, which the, the religious ones are a little more afraid of, right, because there's some dangerous history with that. Um, <laughs> but, but so we're hoping that there's some learning from one another that can happen. Happen. So we hope to hope uh, we hope to organize that in the spring, and uh, you know we wanted to give you one more story, which is an organization which uh, I was lucky enough to, to spend a summer with two years ago in D.C. It's called the Sanctuaries, um, and you know as we had these themes in our head, we were like, well, is there anyone who has all seven themes? And I think this is the closest that we have. So the Sanctuaries is a diverse arts community with soul. Uh, which I just love that. Um, diverse arts community with soul. It is a group of individuals. It doesn't have a space, uh, but it is a group of individuals in Washington, D.C. who get together through the creative arts to um, experience the divine. Um, and it is about combining poetry with hip hop, with uh, you know, a workshop on Jewish mysticism, a beading workshop. Um, they get their performers together to, to sing and make music at social justice rallies. Um, but really, the arts is the language that they all speak. But there are practicing Christians and Jews and Muslims and Hindus and nothings and people who are exploring their African traditional religious heritage who all come together to make meaning and build relationships across difference through the arts. The arts is really the common language. Um, and what I love about this is that it's founded by Eric uh, Martinez Resley, who is an ordained minister. So there is someone who at the heart of it has kind of rooted himself in a tradition, in a, um, a language of God and the something more, which allows everyone else to do it. And he spent a good two years trying and failing. At first he was like, he came out of HDS and was like, well, maybe it's like small groups, let's try that. And yeah, no, it didn't really work. Maybe it's like, well, we all get together and like make music and there's candles. It's kind of like a revival thing. No, that's not it. And so he just started getting artists together. And being in DC, wanted it to be a multiracial community. Um, and what I just love, you know, he met people on um, uh, Craigslist. He spoke to people in cafes, like all the traditional things that you would do when you're starting a community. But he really, he really went deep. Um, and so I thought we'd show you just a little video maybe of um, Let the Sanctuaries uh, Introduce Themselves. But try and watch out for you know, all seven themes if you can as you, as you hear what people are saying um, about their experience of being part of this community. So community, accountability, personal transformation, social transformation, purpose finding, creativity, and this something more. You know, I'm a big Sanctuaries fan, man. <laughs> Make sure you get the shirt. <laughs> A lot of people were looking for the same things and we just kind of formed like Voltron. We came together like that. I heard this real yearning for a safe and a sacred space, hence the name Sanctuaries, where people could come together of diverse backgrounds and really show up as their full selves. And the only way I believe that connect, true connections are made is by authenticity. It's not like we tolerate each other. I mean, like, there's really a deep commitment to, like, I want to know what's real for you, and I want you to know what's real for me, and, like, we can, that can be completely different, and that's completely okay. I'm learning a lot from different people's cultures and different people's religions, you know, and I'm learning a lot about myself because, you know, it's like, oh, wow, like, I am different, like, from, from certain people, and it helps me understand myself. The idea of the sanctuaries draws a certain person in, you know, the idea of being in a diverse, multicultural, multi faith space that draws certain people in. We have some people like us that are couples, you know, that are in the sanctuaries. We met in the sanctuaries, which is really cool. Um, but there are other people who have brought their partners or brought their spouses into the community, and we, you know, actively supported those relationships. Um, it's an exciting opportunity to see growth in someone uh, that you that you care for. For me, there's something about the community which encourages us to discover ourselves and 
find unique ways of self-expression, that only when we find those unique ways of self-expression can it come together in a collaborative way. Mm -hmm. Connecting over the creative process, and I think that that's something that's crucial as well. Definitely, Definitely. open to any <laughs> yeah, we form of that. art. Yeah. Any form of art is welcome in the sanctuary. I remember when Shagoon and um, Arvin first did that piece oh, at the open mic. Hot. So it's like that was classical hot. Indian and rap. And it was like, oh, it was yeah. like very cool. Oftentimes people will come to us through the community, discover their voice, claim their story, express themselves artistically, and then say, what's next? How do I move from that personal work to now partnering with different justice organizations and putting my art in service of promoting social change. And that's where the collective comes in. We collaborate with each other not only in the sense of three different people coming together, but three different art forms. Live painting, and we have like jewelry makers, and we have shirts that people have uh, screen printed. Well, I really enjoy the collaboration aspect. Everybody brings a unique perspective. You know, we start with a little jam session, you know what I'm saying? And then we hear what everybody else is creating and we're like, yo, that's dope. When we're talking about social change, when we're talking about featuring stories and humanizing issues that can feel so abstract, I think the arts are indispensable to that. They're what bring justice to life, especially for people who don't have immediate access to that issue. Law can change people's mind, but you know, things like music and you know, the creative arts, I mean, those are the kind of things that change people's hearts. Don't you know you're a child of the sky? Child born isn't warned about the war coming storm. What's it for? He's unsure, but sees more than what is told. What a shame if he never came. So what's interesting is that Eric is a Unitarian Universalist, but I asked the people who are part of the community, Erin, who was talking about her, her and her partner, James. I was like, so Erin, have you come across Unitarian Universalism? She's like, huh? <laughs> no. <laughs> they, like, it's not about, Eric's not trying to get people to be connected to what he's connected to. He's trying to get them connected to what they're connected to. Um, and it's just this generous um, project of love, which is just so powerful. Um, the one theme that I think they're struggling with most is the accountability theme, uh, unsurprisingly. So um, they've, they're trying to figure out, like, well, what does it mean to be a member of this community? Um, so they now have you know, Eric's the lead organizer, but then there's a team of, of five other organizers who really take a leadership role, and then the next level, um, and then the kind of base membership level. And there's now, you know, Eric was shy about it, but there's now a financial commitment to be part of it. Um, but so that, you know, these questions are not all solved. I don't want to say like this is perfect, but I, I just think this is something which, um, for me, offers great hope because it comes out of who you all are, um, but it has this incredible new lease of life and new shape um, which I think uh, is, is something that's really possible. Yeah, and just to say in closing, I think one of the insights that has come out of doing this work is just to see individuals taking that creative ownership, ownership of trying something. And in, in this context to, to say, I guess to entertain the possibility that you are God's next thing. <laughs> and not in the ego sense, but in the sense of, of, of what John Wesley did as an individual who, of profound spiritual insight and extraordinary investment in the community that he was part of. Um, there's, th there's such a beautiful legacy that, that you're in on, in that way. And in, I see these innovators trying. <laughs> They're trying to apply their, their generative, creative, spiritual energy to, to making things better and to bringing people together. And um, they, they, could really, they could really benefit from, from the wisdom that comes from this tradition. So we'd love you to just spend maybe uh, three, four minutes on your table, just kind of like saying out loud what you have in your brain right now. Um, so what, what resonates? What provokes, you know, what questions do you have now? What maybe doesn't make sense? Um, and then after that, we'll um, take about 20 minutes of questions. Is that, is that good, Ronald? Okay, great. Um, so, yes, please.
Talk amongst yourselves. Get, get the perfect question. <laughs> or a good enough question. Sorry, I didn't want to pressure you. That totally that didn't help. OK, everybody. I, I don't have the same patience as John, so I'm just going to talk really loudly until you stop talking. <laughs> um, what would you, are, are there any pressing questions that, that came up from your table? <laughs> yes, over there, lady at the back. Do we want to use the throwing thing, which was so cool? Yeah, that was awesome. Sorry to keep you waiting. <laughs> we, do you want to just go ahead and we can do the box with the next one? Yeah, that's a great question, and, and it does point to something just in general about the work that we have done so far, which is that it is quite limited and incomplete. Just as, I mean, I'm sure that's obvious, but much of what we have found, because it's presented in many similar ways on the internet, and because the people that lead one thing are connected to people who lead another, has skewed very, as you say, has skewed in cities and urban contexts, um, and has been in some way to address the anonymity that happens there. I think the organizations we've found here, in some cases, have spread to more rural contexts. I think about, I don't know, something like Tea with Strangers is definitely, it's, it's pervading into areas that where there is a desire for connectivity that's not being met, but that are not urban. But I think, at least from what I can call to mind right now, the majority of the initiatives that are starting are, are coming out of cities. Would Definitely. And I mean, for, for me, that makes sense because it's easier to be anonymous in a big city. It's, uh, you know, th there's, there's an interesting racial dynamic in terms of the organizations that we mapped because, uh, you know, the organizations that kind of want to be seen and uh, have the shiny website are white organizations. Um, and so there's, but again, I think there's an interesting dynamic because we know that disaffiliation is a larger trend amongst white youth. Um, and so there's, I, you know, I, I don't know if this is the case. And we don't even know if the organizations that we profiled are mo mostly people who are not religious. You know, as, as Angie was saying, Zoe, our friend, is very Jewish, but also a huge Soul Cycle fan. So it's, it's a false distinction to say they're completely separate. But um, the, the question of the rural urban one is, I mean, the US Department of Arts and Culture has a lot of local groups who do imaginings all over the country. But uh, I mean, the centers of uh, the hubs for this is definitely urban. That's very true. Well, and I'd be curious to talk to you because some yeah. of what, uh, what it's, even though we don't know that uh, the unaffiliated are the same population that are participating in these communities, we do know that disaffi disaffiliation is happening more in urban areas. And it seems as though the community fabric um, that was present through religion is still more present in, in rural and less populated areas than it is in urban areas. But w that's research that we have yet to do, so we should talk about it. <laughs> yes, at the back. I'm so glad I don't have to catch it because I would suck at it. <laughs> It looks okay. good. So. Okay. All right, so. Is it on? Oh, yeah. Wow. Okay. Um, two questions. One is Have you seen any commonalities with these groups where they're trying to break from, or maybe they're not, uh, community via commodity? Because uh, it's still, you know, Soul Cycle is still a product uh, that you pay. And does, does it break down if there's an offering basket rather than a, a fee? Uh, so where's the commonalities in that? And the second one is, if you've seen any commonalities in how they communicate value to the next generation, you know, is, is it as simple as CrossFit for kids? Or Because we focus on, on young adults, we, are, we start now there, we're already behind the curve you know, with, with, with children. So we wanted to see if you have any commonalities that you've seen of how they communicate value to a younger generation. Definitely. I'll, I'll start with that question first. And often these organizations are set up by people kind of our age, for people our age. And of course, the next stage is kids. And they're like, oh, 
we should include kid things, and that happens. So Brooklyn Boulders, which is a kind of climbing space, co-working space, yoga space, event space, uh, I think Chicago, Boston, and New York um, has all sorts of activities for kids as well because the people who are coming just started bringing kids. Um, so often it's a very organic process where people are like, oh, this is important. Um, I don't think what, you know, there's no kind of religious education equivalent. I, 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 at least I haven't seen that. Um, Although I am glad you asked that in light of what you have to give. <laughs> I think that that is a huge uh, incoming question and need for all of these communities. And some of them, like Brooklyn Boulders and more, yeah, more of the fitness ones have fitness started ones. to address it. Uh, but it's definitely yet to be fully understood and then worked on, I and, would say. And it's also not just down, it's also up. Right. I think, you know, one Big of the time. things that we did at the gathering, which a lot of people commented on that they were grateful for, was that we had um, some elders present within the circle of people that we'd gathered. So just to be amongst someone who was in their 70s, who just was quiet most of the time, but then when she said one thing, everyone was like, oh. You know, <laughs> like, that's so powerful. And people like me don't find intergenerational community really anywhere. So if, if that's something these organizations and you are able to offer in a way, it's something that people won't really know how to engage with, but will really appreciate once they have an experience of it, I think. Um, and now I've totally forgotten the first yes, question. Yes, to the, to the money question. Oh, yes, yeah. Uh, Right, so <laughs> I, I think in our examination of this landscape, we've definitely been more sympathetic and interested in the ones that are, are less on the commodity and more on the community. And so there are actually a healthy number of examples from this whole uh, study that are totally free. And those tend to be the ones that are going through the challenging questions of, OK, do we pass an offering basket? OK, do we just rely on crowd funders? Do we not get salaries? Do we, you know, all of these questions that they're not alone in confronting, but where they have had an unwillingness to commodify what they do. And that is an open question as far as, because we do see, because people are used to paying for yoga classes, and so SoulCycle can ride on that. And you know, we're used to paying for physical fitness. Somehow those groups, which are also for profit, can, can just go right into the landscape that already exists of expectation that people expect to pay. Whereas something like the dinner party certainly can't, right? People don't expect to pay for potlucks. <laughs> um, so there's... And I mean, I'm, I'm experiencing this myself. So I run this Harry Potter as a sacred text group with Vanessa Zoltan, uh, my partner in that work. And so we say, it's an expected donation of 10 bucks every time you come. Our average donation is nearly $4. That really sucks. And we're being sponsored by the, the Humanist Hub, which, which you know, pays her salary and pays me a little bit. Um, but without that institution, we, we, couldn't, well, we couldn't get paid for what we do. We'd still do it because we love doing it. But so that, I, I don't think we can just say, well, the model of everyone should move to is church because I don't, like, that's also not working, as we've seen. Um, so I think that the, the, absolutely we should reject the commodification, but we right. shouldn't re reject commerce. And one of my favorite examples is the, the pop-up Shabbat example in, in, in New York, because um, Dania Cheskis Gold, who runs that, kind of is using the Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley model of, um, this is where I have to remember if I really got it right, but community content and commerce. So community is built through these, these dinners that they have together. The, um, the content is through a bi-weekly newsletter called The Ish, which basically has fun, interesting things. She curates content, essentially, um, of what to do in the New York area, which kind of has an interesting Jewish vibe. Um, and then commerce is she's going to sell cool, new, modern Judea Judaica uh, objects online. And that's a model that's going to somehow, hopefully, work for, for the community that she's building. But it, it's a real challenge. It's something that a lot of the organizations that we brought together are struggling with, particularly because they're so uncomfortable to you know, want to be paid what they're worth. Um, that's really hard to ask if you're doing this great love of, of active service. But at the same time, you know, my friend Ingrid, who set up this thing called the Campfires, which brought elders and youngest together, she put, you know, she works a pretty kind of high-end corporate job, but put all her savings into it. Um, then there was just a kind of awful thing, which meant it all broke down because one of the elders ended up uh, essentially committing sexual abuse three or four times within the community. She didn't really know how 
you know, was, she wasn't trained on how to handle it, so did her best, but it didn't quite work out, and they had to shut it down. And there go all her savings, you know. So there's, uh, the, the answer is not in any of these, I don't think. I think we're really still struggling how to figure that one out. Sorry. Uh, I would say there's definitely a strong response that seems to happen to the name Jesus among many of the constituents of these groups that is not positive. Would you say that? Jesus doesn't mean love to my people. That's not what we've heard. Um, and, you know, this is maybe my, where my theology is different, but like, for me, the, the Jesus part isn't really necessary. Um, and I know that's, that's probably where we differ. Um, but, you know, I, again, I'll just turn to this Harry Potter example because that's a story the people I work with know and love and trust. And let me tell you what happens in that story. Someone <laughs> sacrifices themselves for the good of others, you know? And so I, I kind of, that's good enough for me. If, if we get to talk about meaning and values and... Um, you know, what it, what it takes to be a good person and, and how we can help each other to do that, that's enough for me. And I think that's probably enough for, for most of the people um, we've been talking about. But that, that may change, kind of depending yeah. on what you do, I guess. Well, and coming from the perspective of, you know, I, for me, I, I can't leave Jesus out of the story personally, um, but my, it has been an adventure in, incorporating the teachings of Jesus as I understand them into this work um, and only, only talking about the source <laughs> of those teachings when it feels like it would actually uplift the particular situation and the person that I am in conversation with, which, you know, this is all, this is all work that you've all been doing for a long time. So I don't, but I, I, I guess, I don't think that Jesus has to be ultimately left out of it so much as the, the cultural moment that we're living in is one where there's a lot of PTSD around the ways that Jesus' name has been used. And so we have to live in that for now. But also, like, you know, if you want to see a church without Jesus, come to the UU church. Like, they're struggling too. So that, that's not the answer is right. to just take Jesus out and do the same thing anyway. Um, does that make sense? Yes. Other questions? Yes. So. Oh, sorry, we forgot about the exciting orange thing. <laughs> My question began when you were talking about CrossFit and new boxes, and, but I'm interested in how it applies to all these organizations as they grow and expand beyond the initial founders and initial community. How do they protect their brand? Uh, question, what if I form a new CrossFit box, I write the essay, I go to the big thing, <laughs> Right. I form a CrossFit box that goes off the deep end and does something that violates what the founders think ought to be associated with the name CrossFit. How are they protecting their brand and providing a kind of discipline for their organization as it grows? They're not. Uh, Cr CrossFit is a highly libertarian organization. People set up a t-shirt company which grew to like be a nearly $2 million business before the head office was like, hey, we should probably talk. Um, I, there are kind of every, you know, there were some t-shirts which were like, I probably won't use the full cuss word, but essentially like, F off, I'm a CrossFitter or something. Like it was something which if you, if, if that was a church, you would be freaking out, you know? Uh, and they were like, yeah, chill. You know, they, they, they really let it slide. Um, and as I said, you could, you could open your CrossFit right next to another one and put it out of business and they'd be totally fine with it. Um, so, I mean, that's specifically CrossFit. CrossFit is very much like laissez-faire, you know, it'll all work out in the end. Um, I think other examples are probably different. Uh, I mean, SoulCycle was very suspicious of us when we called them because they were like, well, we're not a religious thing, you know, so they were very protective of their brand. And I think it's partly because they're appealing to a different kind of person, and so they, they want to protect that much more. But, I, you know, I, I'd say we run the whole gamut um, within, yeah. within the range of organizations. And your question does speak to the broader question of inclusion and exclusion and insider-outsider that Casper alluded to a little bit with something like the dinner party where, you know, they're what kind of loss counts as loss that gets to be part of the dinner party. I, all of these organizations are confronting and will confront questions of that 
nature. And so I think they're all responding differently, but it is a helpful, it is a helpful consideration as far as what does it, what does it say about the strength and integrity of the community um, if, if, you know, if there's a kind of faith that, okay, if some, if some faction of this starts behaving in a way that is not consistent with what we envision as the other parts of this community, how, how do we respond, right? That is, of course, a consideration that has been specifically part of the history of Christianity for, for the whole time. So trying to figure out how to do that lovingly and beautifully is, I think, one of the key questions for, for these groups and, in fact, for like religion and its future. So I, I certainly won't purport to have the answer to that question, but there is something that I do find lovely about the faith that the community is so strong that there can be outreach to a group that is, uh, that is behaving in ways that are different from what was expected that can be compassionate. I mean, what, one example to look at is um, a Sunday Assembly, which is the, the Atheist Church. I don't know if you've, you've come across it. Um, set up in London by two stand-up comedians, so it's really fun to go to. I, spiritual depth, maybe less so. Um, but, you know, they, they, they've already had a split in their movement. The New York Sunday Assembly um, could, you know, some wanted to promote atheism and some wanted to promote life, and so they had a split. Um, so, you know, the same questions that yeah. you all work with is happening in these guys as well, so. Yeah. Yes? Yeah, um, so School of Life is, is uh, short answer, yes. Uh, long answer, I think it, it does great content providing. I don't think it really builds community. Um, uh, we should have an offline conversation more about that. I mean, one thing I love from the School of Life is just how beautiful everything is. Like, just so much attention to detail in the design and the aesthetics of it, which makes you want to come in. And that's what, you know, one of the things that I, um, uh, Sometimes it's such a missed opportunity with the beautiful buildings that churches are. You know, I, I loved, um, and I'm forgetting her name, who was the uh, dean of the Episcopal Cathedral in San Francisco, Jane Shaw. She said, we have this incredible space, these beautiful windows, but no one is coming. Why don't we do something that people love to do just in this space? So every Thursday they started doing yoga. First group was just 10 people. After about five years, there were 600 people doing yoga every Thursday morning in this incredible cathedral space. And so I think just the, the, the idea of beauty is something that is so invitational. Another example, Group Muse, is um, an online, uh, essentially it's a website where um, people who are classical musicians uh, match with someone who has a living room and wants to host uh, a, a small concert in their house. So um, Ezra, who, uh, Ezra and Sam who run it say, well, we're just offering a people to reflect in beauty on their life. That's what they offer. Um, and so, you know, the aesthetics, I think it's something, again, easy to kind of throw away, but it, it's a huge invitational pull. Um, probably have time for one more question. And we're here all the time, so feel free. I also just want to point out a couple of other people who you should talk to about this stuff. Um, Seth and Hillary and Trey are, are three people I know and really respect on these questions, so we're not the only ones who have interesting stories. So can you just give a wave? Thank you, everyone. Talk to them as well. <laughs> uh, okay, one more question. Yes, sir. The, um, um, when you import us not to be trying to turn uh, these folks into Methodists or Christians, uh, it seems to be a very poignant moment. Um, and um, the place where I work, I mean, we, we have been trying to foster the notion among our services that our client is not the institution of the church. Our client is Still, there's value, we believe, in the institution, at least in the potential of the institution of the church that we hope will be on building. Would you say a word about um, how does the institution survive in a time like this? Well, the word that comes to mind is, is transformation. And this feels like a moment of what could be chrysalis into butterfly, um, but 
there's a lot involved in that that could look like the institution isn't surviving <laughs> in that it might have to change so dramatically that it's not recognizable. That, that is not to say that what you just described about the purpose of the institution would need to change. If that is a viable purpose in this world, then it will continue, I believe. Um, but the, as we kind of led with, institutions in general, <laughs> not just religious, and not just UMC, not just religious institutions, but all of the institutions that we created based on a world where we were place-based are shifting and in some cases no longer exist as such because now we have this form of interconnectivity that is new and we do not have the kind of stability that we used to have around the ways that we could engage in each other's lives. And so there's a huge kind of grappling going on across <laughs> across sectors and all over the world that this is um, the, the things that we're mapping are just one symptom of. So I guess the, to reiterate just that kind of spirit that, that compelled the beginnings of this institution, right? It didn't start as an institution. So what is that spirit and how can that spirit move now? Um, well, I think one side point is that if, if, if you give people what they need and want, then they probably will want to talk more to you and learn from you. So I, 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 I don't want to say like more people shouldn't become Methodist. That's, that's not what I'm about. But um, if that's why you're doing it, then it's not going to work. But if, if you end up building, I don't know, I think Sarah Miles' story is, is, is really helpful. Um, you know, Andy shared about it yesterday. Um, she was looking for something and she, she found it and she was like, okay, these are the people I'll commit to. Nadia Boltz Weber was the same thing. She said, Lutherans were the first people who told me that I was 100% sinner and 100% saint. And for that, I will always be grateful. And now she's the leading light in the Lutheran movement. You know, I, th I, th I think if you can do that, people will, will dig deeper into what you're giving. Um, so with that, we've come to the end of our time. Um, oh, I just missed that one. Um, could, could we maybe close in a little moment of um, closing our eyes and opening our hearts? <laughs> Here we are. <laughs> I'm so grateful that you invited us to be here and that you bared with us as we shared some ideas. But I'm really grateful for the commitment that each of us has in this room to build a world of joyful belonging, to keep asking questions and be brave, to know that we probably won't have the answer, but we maybe have an answer. I hope that something in us can blossom forth that we don't even know yet what it is. Something that is beautiful, that gives people hope and courage, that reminds them who they are. We have so much to give, and sometimes we just need to get out of our own way to give it. Thank you for being here together. I'm grateful, very grateful for each of you.